Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad Wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Ayyu ala habba Continue on in our study of Buluga Maram The Book of Marriage And we were in the uh, chapters re in reference to anathaka or maintenance and we reach the 981st hadith uh, and these group of ahadith they clarify for us the Islamic rulings regarding uh, nafaka or maintenance for one's family for how a man should spend on his family uh, what are the rights of the woman who has been divorced and if she's pregnant and all of these various masail as well as when a woman has been widowed what is the allowance that they should be allotted from the wealth of the man so all of this has to do with a nafaka and in the hadith narrated Jabr radiallahu ta'an in a hadith which he attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam regarding a pregnant woman whose husband died. She has no maintenance rights. Al-Bayhaqi reported it. Its narrators are reliable, but Al-Bayhaqi said the correct narration is that which is mawquf, meaning a saying of the of a sahabi or a companion it was established that no maintenance is due to a woman who was divorced by three pronouncements in the hadith of Fatima uh, bin Qais which uh, we already studied prior to this time uh, reported by Muslim so in this hadith it shows that a non-pregnant woman uh, that has been divorced three times, talaq ba'in, by common consensus is neither entitled to a house or expenses. A pregnant, thrice divorced wife, a woman is only entitled to her living expenses, expenses and not the house. A non-pregnant widow is only entitled to a house and not the expenses. A pregnant widow is entitled to a house. And there is no difference of opinions amongst the scholars whether or not she is entitled to her living expenses. The discussion concerning the boarding and lodging prolongs concerning the woman during Edda. Once her Edda period is over, she is not entitled to anything at all. And this is uh, when a woman's Edda, her waiting period has ended. Of course, she's not, as we have studied prior to this, she's not entitled any <clears throat> uh, from this hadith uh, one of the important things is just a, a brief uh, review over what uh, over the different categories of uh, nafaka for uh, the woman in the various situations so for example First, it's an obligation to give nafaka or spending uh, under all circumstances for a woman that is in her edda, and you are uh, she's still you are still responsible for her. Meaning, the man is still responsible for her, and she's in her edda when she has talaq raji'iya that they can still have the opportunity to come back to one another. To unite their family then in this situation there is no disagreement that the woman uh, is in uh, is deserving of nafaka or spending unless of course a very rare exception is if she is uh, a very disobedient woman meaning she's doing something very wrong in Islam she's leaving uh, the home residing with someone else when she's supposed to be in the house and this is especially not under a situation of abuse or something like this, but she's just disobedient. She could be doing all kind of things. 
So, under these circumstances, if she is nauseous, then the scholars mention that in under those circumstances, during that time period, she is not, uh, it is not obligatory to uh, spend, uh, to spend upon her, even if she uh, is in the, the state of Raji'iyah. Um, another important category that we need to uh, discuss, <clears throat> and we've discussed it prior to this, is when a woman has talaq uh, al ba'in. You know, that it's the permanent divorce, that she's been divorced three times. Uh, either be fisk or talaq, meaning fisk, meaning that they've been separated, maybe by the courts or whatever, or it is like um, a khula or something that totally uh, abrogates their nikah, or that it is uh, the permanent talaq. Under this circumstances also, she is not entitled to nafaka because there is no returning for, for her and her husband under those circumstances. Uh, and unless, of course, she is uh, pregnant. So the exception in that scenario would be as if she's pregnant. If she's pregnant, then of course he must spend on her until she delivers the baby. And then of course he's responsible for his child. The third category is al-ba'in bil mot, is when the woman uh, has been divorced three times and the husband dies. So uh, this is the situation that was mentioned in this uh, in this narration, and in this situation there is no uh, nafaka for her. There's no maintenance for her. Uh, even if she was pregnant. So, uh, this is the scenario in which uh, uh, this hadith, or the context of this hadith. And so, <coughs> uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So, this just gives us an indication and a brief revision of the various categories um, with regards to maintenance and uh, uh, the spending upon uh, either the widow or the the wife or the ex-wife and the various categories and ahkam pertinent to it. In the next hadith, uh, narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the upper hand is better than the lower one. And one of you should spend first on those he is responsible to provide for. Lest a woman would say, feed me or divorce me. Reported by Adar Qutni and its chain of narrators is Hassan or is good. So this hadith, it tells us that in the case a man does not or cannot meet the living expenses uh, of his spouse, then there must be separation between them if the woman demands this. Uh, and however, as we, we talked about prior to this, that the better of the scenarios in most cases is that the woman is patient with her husband under these circumstances. And also from amongst the some of the scenarios <clears throat> is for example if a a man uh, is refusing to uh, to spend upon his wife then of course then she has that right to ask for the khula or to be separated. Then that, that's a pretty clear scenario. But what about the case when the woman is, uh, uh, when, the, when the man, ha for example, has sh is striving to provide uh, a living and spend upon his family, but he lost his job and he is having great difficulties finding, another, finding other employment or what is sufficient to take care of his household. So this is the scenario where, of course, that... Uh, it is better for the woman to be patient, 
in in most circumstances in order to uh, you know preserve our family and especially if children are involved so very very important for us to uh, consider those uh, scenarios and in in the next hadith Narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The upper hand is better than the lower one and one of you should spend first on those on those he is responsible to provide for lest the woman would say free feed me or divorce me, reported by Adar Qutni in its chain of narratives is Hassan. Okay, in this hadith, uh, some of the benefits of this hadith, this is the same hadith, uh, some of the benefits of this hadith, first, is that it shows that the the superiority of spending uh, of spending instead of receiving meaning that to be someone who is responsible and caring and taking care of their responsibilities uh, or being the the one who gives is better than being the one who receives or the one who uh, the one who is who begs this is the main point it's better to give than to beg or ask. Uh, and this hadith uh, is one of those hadith which illustrates that for us. And of course, there are those, those times when it, there um, are under exceptional circumstances where a person may require to the need of someone else. They may be under desperate circumstances. But as we mentioned prior to this, that uh, that that is a very dangerous situation. That if someone begs or is excessively asking people when they don't really have the need and they have not made any effort to better their own circumstances, then this can be a very this has serious consequences, as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam uh, mentioned in a sound hadith. Another benefit of this hadith is it also shows that it is an obligation to uh, begin spending upon those whom you're responsible for first. That everyone, and this is in accordance with the statement the Prophet said, that begin, one of you should begin with the one they are responsible for, or those they are responsible for. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is it also shows us that a woman has the right uh, to to seek uh, uh, to to ask for divorce if she is not being spent upon, and we already discussed this in some of the situations, the difference, uh, if a man is uh, able then uh, to, to spend, but he chooses not to, then she definitely has that right, and that's very clear. Uh, however, if it is a, a temporary situation, meaning temporary, not at his, uh, by his choice, out of his circumstances, some excessive circumstances, uh, then of course, uh, it is better preferred that she is patient under those circumstances to be uh, to support her her husband and and her uh, keep her family together. Another benefit of this hadith is it shows us that <coughs> that as long as there is a reason <coughs> that as long as there is a reason. Uh, a legitimate reason, then it's permissible for a woman, of course, to ask for divorce or a khula. In the next hadith, uh, narrated Sa'id ibn, uh, ibn al-Musayyib, regarding a man who finds nothing to spend on his wife, they are to be separated, reported by Sa'id ibn Mansur from Sufyan, from Abi Zinad, from Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, 
He said, I asked Sa'id ibn, uh, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, is this sunnah? And he replied, yes, it is sunnah. This hadith is a strong morsel, meaning a missing link after the tabi'i. So this hadith also illustrates for us that <clears throat> the that if a man uh, is unable to care for his family, that the woman has this khayar, she has this choice. She can ask for divorce. And we already mentioned prior to this, those very uh, scenarios or situations. Either one, he is unable to care for her, and this is what it seems in accordance with this hadith, uh, regarding a man who finds nothing to spend on his wife. This seems to be the context of this hadith. That this is the man who is unable to spend upon his family. So that it is not something he intentionally is doing. Uh, and that they are to be separated. And uh, so this is in accordance with our choice. And if he actually is deliberately doing this, then it's very clear Then. Uh, especially at the woman's insistence that they should be divorced. Narrated Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu <clears throat> he wrote letters to the commanders of the armies regarding some men who have been absent from their wives, meaning some of the soldiers. And, uh, that they should impose upon them to spend on their wives or divorce them. And if they divorce them, they should then send the maintenance, which they have withheld. A Shafi'i reported it, then al Bayhaqi, with a Hassan, a good chain of narrators. So in this hadith, uh, this hadith illustrates for us that first the inaya or the um, the vigilance and the the importance that Umar bin al Khattab radiallahu uh, ta'ala gave to uh, responsibility in general, and that even this was instructions given to his his armies that they should be concerned about those who uh, they are responsible for, meaning their families. And so this hadith illustrates us some of that fadl of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Abi Hafs Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that this is something he gave great importance and that this was the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that uh, being concerned about those you are charged in authority over and uh, taking on uh, one's responsibilities. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows that if that a, a person um, or a man specifically uh, is responsible for his for for maintaining uh, and keeping the maintenance over his family. And if he refuse, then he is forced to divorce them, to separate from them. Because that's their right. They're, they should not be waiting in limbo, waiting to be spent upon and struggling, perhaps even begging. And unfortunately, as we see that this happens uh, often in many communities. And so we already talked about in depth in the prior hadith, about when a man is not spending when he's refusing to spend. Uh, another <clears throat> benefit of this hadith is that also it shows us that the nafaka or the maintenance of the woman does not uh, diminish due to uh, time, due to time, uh, uh, due to due to the time, uh, the passage of time. And this is because, as was mentioned in the hadith, that uh, Umar said, uh, and if they divorce them, they should then send the maintenance, 
which they have withheld. So this shows us that since, you know, they were soldiers in the battles, they were on the battlefield, and they were out, out on expeditions, but they were still held responsible for spending upon their families, and the time period uh, was not a factor, meaning that if they did choose to divorce them and say, okay, I'm getting rid of this responsibility, which of course would be their family, separating from their family, then they still would be held responsible for the nafaka, the period that they did not spend on their family. So for example, if someone is on an expedition uh, for five months, for example, and especially in those, uh, in, in, in even in contemporary war, uh, people are away from their families for periods of time. They do a tour of duty or what have you for long extended periods of time for a year, two years sometimes, or many months, whatever the case may be. So say, for example, it was six months and the man had not spent upon his family for those six months. And then it has now become an issue where the wife is saying, I want uh, my right. We, we're struggling. We need to be spent upon. So according to the hukum of Umar ibn al-Khattab to, the, to this uh, narration that the six months of which the woman had not been spent upon, the family had not been spent upon, the man would be responsible for spending upon his family. And those are some of the main benefits of that hadith. <clears throat> In the next hadith, narrated Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'an, a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, I have a dinar. He said, spend it on yourself. He said, I have another. He replied, spend it on your children. He said, I have another. He replied, spend it on your wife. He said, I have another. He replied, spend it on your servant. He replied, or he said, I have another. He replied, you know best with what to do with it. A Shafi'i and Abu Dawood reported it. And the wording is Abu Dawood's. A Nisai and Al Hakam reported it with the wife preceding the children. In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a very, very important hadith uh, in the chapter of Nafaka for the reason that it is in reference to maintenance, to the maintenance and the caring for uh, and the expenditures for the family and those we are charged in authority over. And so from this hadith, some of the more in benef uh, more important benefits of this hadith is first <clears throat> is this illustrates that if there are two hakuk or rights to be met of two sep uh, separate individuals at the same time that uh, first and foremost that those who are have the the greater rights to be spent upon they should be spent upon so that's first and foremost what we learn from this hadith is that we uh, give everyone their due rights and those with the greater rights of course we attend to their needs first uh, and then on down the line for those who have less rights however <clears throat> Some of the ulama mention that if, uh, and also deducing fr deduce from this hadith, that if there are equal rights, for example, a person perhaps has two wives, uh, where does one begin their expenditures? So the wi wives obviously have equal rights over the husband. One, not because of her age, not because of her beauty, not because of her kindness, or this one is better in religion, or this one is better in this. No, but rather the fadl 
the uh, as far there there is no uh, the the equality is intrinsic to their rights, meaning it's intrinsic to Islam. Islam has given them both equal rights; that they both have a right, uh, the same right to be spent on by the husband. So, if these two various rights are now uh, there's a difficulty in giving both the rights at the same time, then which do we choose? How do we make the choice? And this is done, <clears throat> as some of the ulama mentioned, by drawing lots. Like in the case of uh, when the husband, uh, a man is going to travel and he has more than one wife, and to choose which wife to go with him, uh, then they draw lots. And so this is also the situation uh, under this uh, these circumstances. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Another benefit of this hadith that a person if they give the, their their obligations, <clears throat> they they finish off uh, uh, paying doing their obligatory duties with regards to spending. Then they have the choice to do whatever they wish with their wealth. Of course, that is not wasteful and is not as in being spent in the muharramat. And this is illustrated from the hadith. Uh, and from the statement when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Enta a'lam, that you know best, meaning you know best in which way to spend, uh, on how to spend your wealth. Because uh, in the hadith, <clears throat> uh, it, it was a situation where a man, he came to the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, and he mentioned that he had a dinar, dinar, you know, which was the currency that they one of the types of currencies that were popular in their time. And he وسلم, said, spend it on yourself. So he first gave that the man should spend it upon himself, you know, on his meeting his needs, so that way he's able to take care of his family and do what he needs to do. Um, and then he replied in this narration, spend it upon your children. <clears throat> and then he said, I have another dinar. He replied, spend it upon your wife. Uh, he said, I have another dinar. He said, spend it upon your servant. And then he said, I have another. So he replied, you know best with what to do. So this is illustrating that uh, a person, after meeting the, their, their, the rights, that their, resp their responsibilities, then they uh, can use their expenditures uh, for whatever they choose to which is, of course, within lawful means. So this hadith also, as we mentioned in the, the wording of, of Abu Dawood and Isai and Al-Hakam reported it, with the wife preceding the children, okay, with the wife taking precedence over the children. So they both have very strong rights, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. <clears throat> in the next uh, narration, narrated uh, Bahzi bin Hakim <clears throat> on his father's authority from his grandfather. I asked, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to whom should I be kind, for, kind and dutiful? <clears throat> he replied, your mother. I asked, who comes next? He replied, your mother. I asked, who comes next? He replied, your mother. I asked who comes next. He replied, your father. Then your relatives in order of nearness of relationship. Abu Dawood, Abu Dawood and a tirmidhi reported it. The latter graded it as Hassan or good. This hadith, the hadith of Bahzi bin Hakim, uh, this hadith <coughs> illustrates for us the importance of bitter walidain or the 
being uh, obedient and righteous and pious towards one's parents and especially the mother that the mother has uh, very uh, very great rights in fact some of the greatest rights over a person uh, that one can have and this is also illustrated in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَقَضَى رَبُّكُمْ أَلَا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says for Kitab al-Kareem uh, and your Lord has commanded you to worship him and him alone not associating any partners with him and to your parents uh, be pious or righteous and obedient. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has coupled, uh, you know, after his right, but actually, in fact, in this ayat, along with his right, showing the importance of the, the, the sharf and the importance and the greatness of being obedient to one's parents and that it is such a great duty and responsibility and good deed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned it along with Tawheed. So it shows that doing it is one of the greatest deeds you can do and by leaving it, it's one of the most grievous sins that you can do. Meaning leaving off the responsibility of being kind and gentle and pious and humble uh, towards one's parents and the benefit of it this being illustrated in this chapter is because of course this chapter has to do with maintenance nafaka and in case one's parents are in need of nafaka you know one has poor parents or parents that are restrained in their means and they have the means to be able to care for their parents then they their parents have great duties and first and foremost, or the one who has the most importance, of course, is the mother. The mother has even a greater right over the father. Because this is what they, the Nusus illustrate for us, the text. And this hadith being one of those, um, one of those uh, texts which illustrate for us that the mother has the uh, greatest right, ha has one of the greatest rights over us. And so this is a, a very important illustrate, illustration and it shows us that uh, if our mother is in need, then we should be uh, rush to spend or give time or whatever it takes in order to uh, serve our mothers. And those are some of the most, uh, one of the most important benefits of this uh, particular hadith, illustrating the manzil or the makana of the mother, the status and greatness of uh, the mother. Chapter 14, <clears throat> al hidana or the chapter of, the, of guardianship. And Havana it means preservation and safety. And according to the Sharia, as a Sharia term, it implies the proper upbringing and care accorded to a minor. If a man divorces his wife in such a condition that both of them are Muslims and have small children, then the woman has more right to claim the custody of her children. The man cannot deprive her of the children by snatching them away from her by force. In case such a child happens to be a milk-suckling infant, the in, uh, infant, the expenses concerning her livelihood and the infant's clothing shall have to be borne by the man until the end of the child's infancy period. Once this span is over, the expenses of the child shall be the liability of his father, regardless whether this child lives with his mother or father. 
As long as the woman does not remarry, such a child shall remain under her custody until he reaches adulthood. In case she remarries, his custody shall be transferred to his father. According to the Hanafi Medhab, if she marries one of the relatives of the child, he will remain in her custody. So there's a, a lot of important uh, details, and we'll get into some of them, with regarding uh, al hidana or the uh, guardianship. And as we mentioned, uh, the guardianship, it means preservation and safety. And it also is in reference to, uh, as we mentioned, as a Sharia term uh, for the guardianship of the child, meaning who's raising the child, where's the child going to live when divorce occurs uh, in a family between the husband and the wife. And along with that, a Hadana also uh, refers to when uh, someone, uh, a general guardianship that someone needs to be cared for, for example, uh, someone who is mentally ill or um, mentally, mentally ill or has some dementia or something like this, then they uh, are in need of guardianship and care. So also Havana has that, uh, that usage as well. Uh, another important, uh, some issues with Havana is that the Havana, as we mentioned, it is, it is uh, preserving the one who's young or who is um, maybe mentally unstable or has, you know, these uh, deficiencies, so to speak. And looking out for their maslaha or the masalah, masalahi. And this means that the importance of the Havana is not just a, a matter of uh, pushing, uh, you know, enforcing responsibilities, but in fact, it is looking out for the well being. True guardianship is looking out for the well being of the person who is in need of a guardian. So, for example, even in the situation of divorce, as we're going to get into some of those issues with the ahadith in this chapter, that we're looking at the, the, the maslaha. It isn't simply a matter of just um, pushing the responsibility or the responsibility just going from one person to another. There is an asl, there is a, a foundation or a base principle that should be followed with regards to this, as we mentioned. And, but there are exceptions because it, uh, and those exceptions are in relation to looking out for the maslaha and the mafsada, the harms and the benefits, taking into consideration the harms and the benefits as many things in the Sharia uh, are built upon. Uh, and uh, another point is to understand that if there is... Uh, for example, the father, for example, as, as was mentioned, the father is responsible for that nafaka and, 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 and that the, in the case of divorce, that the children, they would, they would be under the care of the mother. But if there is, for example, a father who's not taking care of his responsibility, which unfortunately uh, is in the case, can be the case, uh, in, in many family situations, that the father is not res being responsible. So then, of course, under those circumstances, then the, the Havana, the responsibility, it goes to uh, the, the family members. So, for example, if it's a woman, husband and man, they separate, and the man is not caring for his children as he's supposed to. He's not spending that, you know, this is a nafaka. And he's not taking care of the maintenance of his children, which is his responsibility that Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, have given him. Okay, this is an Islamic right. This is his haq. Their children's right. Their right. And with that, if the man is not meeting that responsibility, then obviously the woman has to then, uh, she is responsible. She's caring for uh, her children and she's responsible for spending on them. And if she is unable to alone, then her family, the family, the ki the aqarib, the, the, the family members, they should be coming and taking care of that responsibility. 
And so this is why Sheikh bin Uthaymin, he mentions, he talked about the hukum, hukmaha, the, the, the ruling regarding the Havana, is that it is fardul uh, kifaya, meaning that it is a, an obligation that as long as someone from the community is fulfilling it, then the sin is removed from the rest of the community. So someone has to fulfill that responsibility. So if the father isn't doing his job, then of course the mother has, is stepping up to the plate, and if she's unable to, uh, you know, or what she has is insufficient, then the family must step in. The family must step in, her family or really the father's family. But, a lot, but we know the reality of a lot of situations where the, unfortunately, the, fa the father and his family uh, is not looking out for the well-being and caring for the children. But uh, that is a little discussion of the hukum. Uh, in the first hadith in this chapter, in this, in this uh, chapter 14, Al-Hadana, Guardianship, narrated Abdullah ibn, uh, ibn Amr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a woman said, O Allah's messenger, this son of mine, my womb was a receptacle for him. My breasts were a source of suckling for him. And my lap was a place for him to curl up in. Yet his father has divorced me and wants to take him away from me. Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, replied to her, you have more right to him as long as you do not remarry. Reported by Ahmed, Abu Dawood, Al-Hakam graded it as a Sahih or authentic. So this hadith, it uh, illustrates for us that base principle that when the husband and wife uh, uh, separate, where is the Havana? Where's the asl of the Havana? Where, where does that, that base principle, how does that fit in? Well, the base principle is that it goes to, uh, the child goes to the mother, meaning the mother is the one who keeps the child. Even if the father, he wants to have his children, he, he loves his children, they both love their children, but that right, that right for what she gave and usually the bond and the mercy uh, between the child and the mother is so strong that uh, the Islam has given that right to the mother, and that's the asl, that's the foundation. Again, exceptions to that scenario would be, for example, there are situations, of course, where there are mothers who are not, they're not good mothers, they're unable to meet their responsibilities or unwilling. Some women don't want their children. Some women abuse their children. Some women, uh, you know, are, are uh, you know, foul, uh, around their children and, and irresponsible and in fact evil. So under these circumstances, then for the maslaha of the child, of course this would need to be probably taken to a uh, some sort of, uh, you know, an Islamic judge or some sort of to get an education for the father to take responsibility. What if the woman's, if the woman is a drug addict or she is um, like a prostitute or something like this, then of course the maslaha, the benefit is that it would go to the, uh, would be that the child would be with the father. Otherwise, we see the devastation and what happens to many of the children that are left in a scenario where the mother is in cape, uh, uh, you know, is unable or unwilling to take care of her children uh, properly. Wallahum stand. And likewise with the father. And likewise with the father. So going back with regards to this hadith, show, this hadith shows us that the base, the asl, the foundation is, is that the haq is with the mother. Some of the uh, immense benefits of this hadith. Uh, is this hadith... Uh, shows us that the, first and foremost, as we mentioned, that the mother has more precedence and right uh, to for the Havana, for the guardianship, than the father. And this is what, one of the most important benefits we gain from this hadith. Uh, unless, of course, this is a condition, illa ida tizawajit, unless she has uh, remarried. So if she remarries, then the child uh, goes to the father. 
And this is in accordance with the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And so uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said, you uh, have the most right to the child, you know, the guardianship of the child, as long as you do not uh, get married. And so again, this also takes in consideration uh, this, the the masale and the mafasid. This is the ultimate the ultimate importance that parents need to consider when being under these situations is where's the maslaha of the child, where's the greatest benefit for the child, the greatest well for the well-being of the child. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us uh, that the most important that this hadith is evidence to show that the the maqsood or the intent of the guardianship is that it is looking out for the well-being of the child and responsibility of the child responsibility for the child that that is the most important thing and that's what what uh the shara is looking at so that the asal is is it goes to the woman and if she gets married then it goes to, goes uh, the child responsibility goes to the man, and again, ultimately, it's all about looking out for the best, the well being of the child. And one of the some of the hikmah of also um, when the woman uh, remarries of the children going to the father if he's able to care for them is that. Often, if a, a new man is in the household, he may not, he may or may not have concern for the children and care for them, or he may be abusive sometimes. And uh, this can either be uh, a, a uh, it, this could be, manifest itself either through physical, mental, or spiritual abuse. And this is all very dangerous for the sake of the children. Likewise, if the man uh, has a um, uh, is married. For example, he was married to two wives, and the co-wife. Sometimes the new stepmother can be a problem for those children. If if uh, if they both remarried, and then now the children go to the father, but he has a wife that doesn't like the first wife. Then sometimes, and unfortunately, it is known in certain cultures that there's been there's countless cases of abuse uh from the new stepmother over the children and this this really happens around the world in Islamistan and it's a great evil but this is just something to consider and this is why always looking out for the maslaha of the children is the most important uh aspect regarding hadana another benefit of this hadith is that regardless of whether the father is pleased with that ruling or not, meaning that the Havana, uh, that it goes to, the guardianship goes to the mother, uh, if they divorce, then that is not the consideration. The consideration, again, is the well-being of the children. And the asl, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, is that the child, enti uh, ahakku bihi, that you are more, uh, you have that right, you have the greatest right over them, uh, you know, over the children or the child, uh, as long as you do not remarry. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also, and this is a, um, a, re, a, a rebuttal of the, um, the statement of the Hanafiya regarding this situation, in that the zahir of this hadith, the, the apparent meaning of this hadith, is that there really isn't a difference between if the um, if the woman marries someone uh, who is far or who is a, a relative of the husband with regards to uh, changing the rule of the Havana, that if she remarries, regardless, the, the child goes to the father as as the ruling as is ruled from this hadith and there is no evidence uh, and this is from the general meaning of this nas another benefit of this hadith is that the 
the uh, guardianship of the woman does not uh, uh, is does not cease. She does not cease to be the guardian of of her child due to divorce, and and that is because during the divorce, when the divorce happens, then actually she gains the right of guardianship. And uh, another benefit of this hadith is also this hadith shows that the mother, if she uh, remarries, then the right or the hadana that it goes to the father. And we already mentioned that again, a lot of those ahkam or this this ruling is also um, uh, considers looking at the masala and the mufasid. For the child, the harms and the benefits for the child, which is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate important uh, aspect here, and, you know, regarding the the ruling. <clears throat> In the next hadith, the nine hundred eighty eighth hadith narrated Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala an. A woman said, "O Allah's messenger, my husband wants to take away my son while he has benefited me and provided me with drinking water." from the well of Abu Inaba. Then her husband came and the Prophet ﷺ said, Young man, this is your father and this is your mother. So take whoever of them you wish by the hand. He took his mother's hand and she went off with him, reported by Ahmed uh, and Al-Arba. A tirmidhi graded it as sahih or authentic. So according to the hadith that we mentioned prior to this, a mother has been declared as more rightful in keeping the custody of her children. As we mentioned, that this is the foundation principle. Uh, whereas this hadith gives an option to the child that he may choose to live with either of his parents according to his own free will and choice. The reason for giving him such an option is that the child was grown up and sensible enough to decide as to where he could possibly be better off. Thus, we understand that if a child is grown up and does not need the care of his parents in the matters related to his safety, he can choose either of the parents. So this hadith, uh, this hadith uh, illustrates for us first uh, that uh, that a uh, a child, when they come of uh, a certain age, that they have a, 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 a good sense of their, their, their maslaha, their benefit, uh, then they can choose between the father or the mother. And this uh, statement from the ulama uh, is derived from where the Prophet wasallam, because he gave the choice uh, to, the, to the child to choose between his mother or his father on whom he wanted to stay with. That he had, he had reached uh, seven years old and he had the, the choice. And as we'll discuss very soon, that it isn't so much the age, but it's more of the sense of maturity and uh, the maturity, uh, the intellectual capacity of the child and its maturity, not so much just the age of seven seven years and so the child was able in this hadith uh, to uh, choose and the child chose to be with his uh, his mother by taking the hand of the mother and often you'll find that this may be the case especially under the circumstances the women the mothers tend to be more uh, uh, have the more uh, uh, open affection and mercy for their children and be the most merciful with their children. And the children gravitate towards that mercy. Another benefit of this hadith is that the balug or the one, the one who is able to distinguish, they may not even have reached the age of maturity, but that they are, uh, they have a degree of of maturity, it is not a condition of their age, but rather it comes down to the capacity, the intellectual capacity of the child and what he is able uh, 
to determine or understand f regarding his own uh, benefit. Uh, you know, as far as especially they're probably going to operate more so by affection or by if they're a child who's inclined towards material. If the father is material, has, has the means, then perhaps that may influence too. But often children, they choose by the mercy and that, that, uh, that they get from their mother. However, with regards to this, the scholars, uh, they mention that uh, they, they differ with regards to this issue. Some of the scholars mention that uh, the maturity comes with uh, uh, being seven years. Some of the scholars hold that view that this is uh, what's mentioned in the Hadith and this is, you know, that the child was seven years old and they hold the view that seven years is the uh, when the child has this choice. Uh, another, mo most of the, uh, or another group of the scholars, they hold the view that it is by, um, it is by the child gaining the characteristic of being, uh, meeting the criterion of being mature. So that it is not a case of uh, age, but rather it is actually, is the child uh, mentally uh, mature enough to be able to distinguish. And so this is, uh, uh, this is the, the case for that group of ulama that hold that view. And so this shows us that it is very important uh, that the maslaha or the benefit of the child is always um, to be considered and that this is what the main base principle is with regards to Havana is looking out for the well-being of the child or children uh, not uh, the desires of the adults who uh, have uh, divorced and are looking uh, you know, for their own uh, comfort by being with their child. And so that is one of the most important things that we gain from this hadith and the other ahadith in this chapter. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.